poor old Edith. Poor Edith. Oh, poor Edith. Lady Edith Crawley is the overlooked and underappreciated daughter of Lord and Lady Grantham. I'm afraid Edith will be the one to care for us in her old age. What a ghastly prospect. When we first meet her, I think you would describe her as kind of on the periphery of things. She always seemed to me like an observer and a reader and a, a smart and intelligent girl. Maybe a little catty, a little bitchy. I suppose you didn't want him when he wanted you. And now it's the other way around. You have to admit, it's quite funny. It came from being slightly overlooked in favour of Mary. I was very taken by what you were saying over dinner. So right, Lady Mary, how clever you are. This is exactly what we have to be aware of. Everyone in London is aware. They're not afraid to say the worst thing they could possibly think of to the other. He had a right to know how his countrymen died. In the arms of a slut. Their battle is always about how happy the other one is. So he slipped the hook. At least I'm not fishing with no bait. I think it always comes out of a place of jealousy from one another. They can't bear to see the other one succeeding when they are failing. Spare me your boasting, please. No, he's jealous. Jealous? Do you think I couldn't have that old booby if I wanted him? Even you can't take every prize. Is that a challenge? I think Edith matures out of that a bit, but Mary certainly continues to always try and bring Edith down when she herself is unhappy. She's had so many rolls of the dice, Edith, <laughs> when it comes to men. She's tried a good few times. So we have Patrick, who was her cousin, who she adored, and then died in the Titanic. And then she had a pop at Matthew Crawley, um, took him to some churches, showed him around. He wasn't really interested. It's wonderful to think of all those men and women worshipping together through the centuries, isn't it? Dreaming and hoping much as we do, I suppose. Was the screen a Cromwell casualty? Uh, I dare say. And then in the war, then, we have the farmer, uh, Mr Drake, who she had a little kiss with, but was married. And then we had Patrick the second. Was he Patrick? We don't know, the Canadian. And then there's Anthony Strallen. I've got two tickets for a concert in York next Friday. How nice. Although, I can't... No, I was hoping that Lady Edith might like to accompany me. But I'd love to. <laughs> Sir Anthony was a suitor for Edith that would have been a very simple match. Of all of them, Anthony Strallen is the most traditional choice. Robert. Edith is beginning her life as an old man's drudge. I should not have thought a large drawing room much compensation. He's interested in her, is very sweet, and takes her out. He had a kind of place in society, and she would have been the lady of the manor, and it would have been all of the things that she'd expected for her life. <sighs> all of us married. All of us happy. He decides at the altar that he can't go through with it. Dearly beloved, we are gathered... I can't do this. What? I can't do it. ..is devastating and so humiliating, I think, for Edith, and I think really is, yeah, so traumatising. <laughs> She's sort of bold with it, like, you know, we see the next day that she is not going to give up. Let me bring you up some breakfast. No. I'm a useful spinster, good at helping out. That is my role. And spinsters get up for breakfast. 
All of these disastrous attempts at marriage and uh, love life, I think, really push her into a, a different space. I think, in a strange way, all of the knocks that she's had force her into a far more interesting path where she discovers writing and uh, the newspaper and the magazines, one that's slightly more interesting than just uh, finding a man and finding a husband. God in heaven, Earl's daughter speaks out for women's rights. What? In a letter to this newspaper today, Lady Edith Crawley, daughter of the Earl of Grantham, condemns the limitations of the Women's Suffrage Bill and denounces the government's aims to return women to their pre-war existence. You said they wouldn't print it. Well done. That's most impressive. She writes the letter to the Times and then finds a job in the newspaper. Edith has had an invitation to write a newspaper column. When may she expect an offer to appear on the London stage? And that's where she meets... Michael Gregson's. Here's an idea. Let's uh, let's have lunch tomorrow at Rules. If you accept the job, we'll celebrate. If it's a no, I'll drown my sorrows. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> you look very pretty today. I'm not sure how uh, professional it is of me to point that out. Gregson. I mean, he arrives as this um, sophisticated editor. And someone who's interested in Edith's brain and her writing, and that's very attractive. Now, I've uh, read your piece. Now, of course, the plight of ex-soldiers. It's not an obvious topic for a woman's column. I know it isn't very feminine, but I felt so strongly about it, I thought it was worth a try. No, no, you, you misunderstand me. I like the idea of a woman taking a position on a man's subject. And I was going to say, don't be afraid of being serious when it feels right. We see them at a party where lots of the sort of Bloomsbury group type characters would all be hanging, and I think that's very exciting for Edith. Have you had any more time to think about what I said? You mean our living in sin? We'd only live in sin, as you call it, until the divorce. Don't you want to be with me? You know I do. More than anything my um, incredible beaded dress that I wore in the Criterion. It's a moment in the story that you see Edith sort of become a woman. She is apart from her family and she's meeting a married man. You look very glamorous. I thought I'd make a bit of an effort. Glad you did. She knows he's married, but she's going to go for dinner with him on her own in London anyway. It feels so wild be out with a man, drinking and dining in a smart London restaurant. It's a real moment where she embraces that side of herself. Can I kiss you? Not here. For all these people. I don't care. Kiss me. Now. Rosamond catches Edith coming back very early in the morning um, from Gregson's flat. So she uh, is sort of in her hands, really. Aren't you going to tell me what kept you out until six in the morning? Well, we... <laughs> and she ends up trusting Rosamond with the entirety of her secret. You're a grown woman, and I'm not a spy. But you're gambling with your future, my dear. Be under no illusions. Michael has gone to Germany and has ended up in a brawl with some brown shirts. He meets a, a sorry end there. I can be normal most of the time for weeks on end, but then I think I might never see him again and... <laughs> I know. So she was alone again, um, in a far more dangerous scenario this time with a, with a baby and a huge secret. I think I know how I can keep the baby. What? How? 
To keep her secret, Edith decides to have the baby in Switzerland. Edith feels that she can't leave Marigold in Switzerland, that she has to bring her closer to home. Um, and she gets the help of Mr. Drew, wonderful Mr. Drew, who feels indebted to the Crawley family for letting him stay at the farm. It has to be a complete secret from my family. I'll uh, send a letter to myself tonight and tell Margie it's about an old friend of mine who's died and has to know well for me to take the child. Then nobody but you and I will know. Mr. True, would you do that for me? For you and the little girl, my lady. Yes. They try different tactics of, of having her like a sort of goddaughter um, who's taking a special interest in Marigold. Is you, my lady? Yes, I wanted to bring my aunt to meet Marigold. But it just is too much. It's too much for the True family to cope with. Honestly, Tim, I can't manage it much longer. I'm sorry if she's lonely. I'm sorry she wants a child, but she can't have ours and that's flat. And for Edith. And in the end, she, she takes her away to London. Well, we're together, darling. And I know it's not ideal, but it's such an improvement on being apart that I think we should celebrate. <laughs> I'll order ice cream and a glass of champagne and we'll be as jolly as you like. Yes. That scene really was so, so sad. Edith really wants to celebrate the fact that she has her daughter back in her life. But you see how incongruous that whole moment is of this woman actually alone in a very empty, sad room. Well, I have a different plan. I'd like you to bring her home. Bringing her back and having her at Danton I think the thing with the Crawleys is that they are very accepting, as well as being very traditional. And you love her? Your new granddaughter? As a matter of fact, and perhaps to my surprise, I rather think I will. I think the great thing about Violet is even though she seems like a very traditional woman with very traditional morals, she wasn't born yesterday <laughs> and I think she's more sophisticated um, than any of her family give her credit for. But Granny, is it really suitable that Rose has brought this man here? Oh, my dear, we country dwellers must beware of being provincial. Try and let your time in London rub off on you a little more. Maggie always has these incredible lines that have become her, her catchphrases. <laughs> they need a man to drive the tractor. So I told her I could do it. Edith, you are a lady, not Toad of Toad Hall. Edith, dear, you're a woman with a brain and reasonable ability. Stop whining and find something to do. Oh, don't worry. Your turn will come. Will it? Or am I just to be the maiden aunt? Don't be defeatist, dear. It's very middle class. I'm Bertie Pelham, the agent. Are you often asked to come when they're shooting? But, no, I'm not. But I'm staying for dinner, which they really didn't have to do. It's a really lovely start to their relationship, Bertie and Edith. He arrives at a time where she just, for the first time in years, feels sort of safe. It's not until we see him again in London that you see that he's been in her mind. Lady Edith Crawley. It is you, isn't it? Hello. Uh, Bertie Pelham. We met at Brancaster when it was let to Lord Cinderby. Of course. I'm sorry to be so dense. I remember you very well. I think he finds it all very exciting. She's not only a lady with a great social standing, but she is making something for herself again. No, I meant, all right, I'll come with you. Oh, come with me where? Back to the office. I can make coffee, I can fetch sandwiches, I can carry bits of paper around. <laughs> the night that they work on the newspaper together, you see how she's taken aback with his confidence and his 
ease. What's the idea? At Lady Eltham's costume ball. I can't decide which guests are the most important. Never mind that. Best clothes and prettiest faces. His ability to encourage and support Edith, I think, is very important. You inspire me. Not many people would say that. <laughs> they would if they knew you. But I better just say it. I want to marry you. Oh. After Bertie's proposal, an elevation to Marquis. Bertie Pelham is now the Marquis of Hexham. Yes. Mary is horrified. But that's absurd. If Bertie's a Marquis, then Edith... Edith would outrank us all. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Mary can't cope with the idea that Edith could not only end up married, but married to a Marquis. It just seems too much. Golly gumdrops, what a turn-up! After everything, it turns out that Edith is the one who's going to get the perfect marriage. Not only with someone who she adores, but who is very powerful. And Mary decides to sabotage it. Marigold is my daughter. <laughs>